everybody. Welcome to Saturday Stories, our virtual program where we bring you illustrators from across the world. And this morning, I have the absolute honor and delight of introducing you to Marla Frazee. Some of you may already know her. She's written and illustrated many books. We discovered almost 40 and um, still counting. And she's won two Caldecott Awards uh, for all the world and for two boys have the best uh, week ever. And there's a really fun books as, a, as are many of her books that she's done. And I will discuss a few more of those in just a moment. Marla is also the recipient of our silver medal award for the OA show, which is the original art show, uh, the best of picture books, illustrations for 2023. And this show is coming up um, next week. It's being hung right now. And it'll be on display in our two main galleries at the Society of Illustrators in Manhattan on East 63rd Street. So if you're in the city, do come by and see the original art. You'll get to see the original one of the original illustrations from Marla's book here, The Great Safino, which is written by Matt Barnett. And you'll see over 200 original artworks from some of the best illustrated picture books. Uh, for 2023 and um, there'll be programs and all kinds of workshops uh, to go along with that so do check on our website for events and um, it runs through next year January 26th 2024 is the final day of the show and I also wanted to mention that we are on our third year anniversary of Saturday Stories being um, run as a virtual program, which obviously not only do we reach illustrators from around the world or across the United States, uh, Canada, um, Asia, you name it, we've had illustrators joining us from different places as we have participants. So if you are joining us from somewhere, uh, please, well, you are joining us from somewhere, <laughs> please let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear that. And um, don't forget to also write any questions that you might have from Marla. Uh, they might come to mind while she's showing her presentation. Just write them in the chat or in the Q&A, and I will ask her those questions on your behalf during the workshop portion. Um, so what else did I want to tell you? Gosh, so there's so much to tell you about Marla, but she is going to do a lovely presentation where you'll get to see a slideshow with some visuals um, all about her. But she grew up and was born in California in Los Angeles. Uh, when she was in third grade, she actually illustrated her first book, which was called um, The Friendship Circle, and it won a state award. And it was a collaboration with her good friend who wrote the story. So it started all the way back in third grade. So you out there, kids who like to write books and do illustrations, you could be the future picture book illustrators and authors um, when you're grown up. So keep working on your book ideas and character designs. And today we're going to learn how to do some really fabulous characters because in the book that um, Marla has won the um, OA award for silver medal, uh, the, this is a practically wordless picture book, even though the story idea is completely created by Mac Barnett, the author. There's um, um, you know, some text at the beginning, but then Marla shows you the whole story through many, many images. It's a very magical um, story and she'll share that book with you. Um, and I want you to make sure you've got your art materials ready. You need um, pencils, paper, an eraser, possibly a uh, sharpener. And um, do share your illustrations with us. We'd love to see what you create. Um, you can send that to my email, which Lindsay, who is behind the scenes, will be putting that email in the chat. Um, so what else can I tell you? Gosh, well, uh, Marla has done so many books that I feel like are really great for animation and Boss Baby was made into an animation. And you'll see that when you look at her stories, you can get so many ideas about how to move your characters across the page. And she does so much of this with humor, as well as a lot of sensitivity. Um, there's a beautiful book that she, um, that she wrote in did you write in every life? Was it? It was taken from a blessing, right? So you. Yeah, it was taken from a it. blessing, and I adapted, right? Yes, and it's a gorgeous book. So do look up um, Marla's books in your local bookstores or libraries. Um, they're really amazing, particularly if you are interested in illustrating. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over the beginning of this program to Marla Frazee. Thank you for joining us this morning. 
thank you, Claire. This is so, it's so wonderful to be here. And um, I really, I'm honored to be part of Saturday Stories. I was just talking to Claire about how if there was something like this when I was growing up, I would have just loved it because um, I knew I wanted to be a children's book author, illustrator when I grew up. I just didn't know anybody who did it. And um, it would have been just so incredible to hear somebody talk about their work and show their studio and all that stuff. So I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for having me as as thank you to the Society of Illustrators. Um, I'm excited about the original art show. I love that show. And so what Claire said about going to to see it if you can, I really suggest that. It's such a beautiful historic space to go to the Society of Illustrators building. And the show is just full of all kinds of picture book illustration, book illustration of all kinds that's being done now. It's just such an incredible experience. So Anyway, I'm happy to be here. I think I'm going to start to share my screen and talk yes, about... Thank you, Mala. It's yeah. such a pleasure to have you, honestly. <laughs> Let's see if I can um, do this easily-ish. Yep, it's coming along. We see your screen. Okay, there we go. Look at that. Here we go. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> As Claire said, I'm from LA and um, specifically live in Pasadena. And right now is the time I'm usually in the hills right before I get into my studio. And um, I, I put this picture up because if I'm really lucky, I get to up in the hills and I can see the ocean. So if you look in the background, you can see the blue ocean yeah. back there. And it's not always like that in LA, but sometimes when it is, it just delights me so much. Um, so anyway, I start my day when I can in the hills and then I get to work. And this is my studio where I am right now. It's in the backyard of my house. Um, I love my studio. It's just, it's it looks just, amazing. <laughs> I, love oh my God, this, I just love to get in here. I love to sit and draw here or paint. What's interesting is I do not write in this building. I kind of write other places like in the house or in a coffee shop or, you know, I don't know, other places in my kitchen table, but not in my studio. This is sort of just for drawing and painting um, and thinking. <laughs> so yeah. That's the outside. And this is where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, it's not quite as put together right now is that because I'm in the middle of a project and it's I sort of put everything over in the corner where you can't see it right now but a lot of paper and whatnot is all over the place I have a dog named Toaster who's with me and Toaster likes to sit on the porch and just watch the squirrels while I work right now Toaster is on the floor sleeping so that's where I am and where I work and I just wanted to talk about why I wanted to be a children's book author illustrator in the first place. Um, first off, I love to draw. And this was the first drawing that was saved. My mom saved this drawing. I drew it when I was two and a half years old. <clears throat> and I said it was a cat. Uh, when I show it to kids in schools, they say, that doesn't look like a cat. That looks like a ghost or sometimes a spider or an alien. But, you know, I said it was a cat. So it's a cat more like the tail and a cute face <laughs> yeah <laughs> when I got to be a little older and I was starting to learn how to read and write I would make these books at home and this one is called the cat and the dog oh that's charming it's all the staples um these were just little books that I made when I was hanging around at home and I was just I just loved to think about putting the pages together at that time and trying to figure out some sort of story. And I spent a lot of time doing that. But the book that really nailed it for me in terms of like, this is what I want to grow up and learn how to do was Where the Wild Things Are. And a mm -hmm. lot of people are inspired by this book. To me, it's my favorite book ever. Um, but I was about eight when I saw it for the first time. I was in our public library and I sat on the floor and pulled it off from the shelf. It was a, it was a book that um, 
I already knew how to read, but I loved picture books. And but this one just floored me. And when I saw these page turns where Max's room just turns into a forest in this magic way, three page turns, and then we're in the forest. It just <laughs> blew my mind. I was like, what just happened? I remember the feeling like that was magic. I want to learn how to do that. And so from that point on, that's just all I wanted to learn how to do. How did he do that? Another book that I loved was Blueberries for Sal by Robert McCloskey. And um, one of the things about this book that also blew my mind was instead of it being black ink, it was that blueberry blue ink. And that just felt like such a gift. Like, that was a decision. Like somebody had to decide that. What a great thing. And I also loved little Sal, the little girl in this book. I loved her. I wanted to be her. And I not only wanted to be her, but I wanted to live in her world. Like I loved where she lived. And, you know, I didn't know at the time it was Maine, but I wanted to be there. And that, that feeling of wanting to enter into the space of the book, the setting and be the character was something I had never experienced in a book before. And so these are two of the books that um, just sort of lodged in my mind. And so I kept saying to my best friend, Lisa, here we are dressed alike because we thought nobody could tell us apart that way. She lived down the street from me. We knew each other since we were three. And I'd say to Lisa, like, I'm going to grow up and be a children's book illustrator and she said well why don't we get you started on that like let's let's go and so she said I'll write a story and you illustrate it like what are you waiting for basically and so Lisa wrote the book The Friendship Circle and I did the pictures and this is our title page and when we were finished we took it to our teachers and we were both in third grade and um but we had different classrooms and the two teachers thought like, well, we should send this to the California State Fair, enter it into a competition. And like Lisa and I kind of forgot about it and went on to some other activity, like trying to get, get on TV in some talent show or something. I mean, we would have all these ideas. <laughs> but then, then um, we heard that it had won this award in the State Fair and our school asked us if we would make another copy and they would put it in the school library. So Lisa tried to remember exactly what the words were. And I tried to do the pictures similarly to the first time. And so we did another version. So now there were two, the one at the state fair and that we had one in our school library. Yeah, and, that's publishing. <laughs> yeah. And so we, it was so cool because like I'd walk into this for library time with my class and there was this book up on the shelf, like propped up. And I felt as if I had join the ranks like I have a book in here too so you know yeah. I felt like at that point I had I had made it <laughs> it was it was published in my mind I didn't yeah. know what publishing was but that's felt it felt like I was published um Lisa and I just saw each other last month and th that's a picture we took in Santa Barbara it was so fun to see her so we're still friends my friend from when I was three is still my friend now and I think that's so cool so these were um, like kind of my first books. They're kind of in order. Um, I started illustrating books finally around 1988. That's a long time ago. My first book came out in 90. And then the second book came out in 95. And then the Seven Silly Eaters came out in 97. And then at that point, I was sort of doing, you know, a book almost every year or so. And things kind of started to, it started being, coming my career and I felt so happy and so lucky to be able to do these books um this is sort of like a middle period um you might recognize some of them boss baby's in here somewhere I think yes yes love that. oh there it is on the bottom and um in the middle you might see Clementine and Waylon those are like chapter books for like early reader not early readers middle grade chapter books and um by Sarah Pennypacker. And that was something I always wanted to try my hand out, try my hand out, out at, because like, I loved Beverly Cleary's books mm -hmm. that were specifically the ones illustrated by Lewis Darling. Um, 
his illustrations of her stories, whether it was Ramona or Henry or, you know, Ribsy, any of the books that he did, he illustrated of hers. I loved those books so much. So I felt like with Clementine, Sarah's books were so funny and I was able to do those kinds of illustrations in a book that was very different from a picture book. But I think my heart is definitely in picture book illustration. Um, these are the later books that I've done. And um, the ones, as Claire said on the bottom, The Farmer and the Clown was the first of this wordless trilogy of books I did. So The Farmer and the Clown is the beginning book. And then The Farmer and the Monkey is the middle book. And The Farmer and the Circus is the finale book of that story all told wordlessly and um, sort of got, they have individual stories and then their own arc as a whole. And I was really proud of, of those books. That was a big project for me. Yes. Thank you. And then these two are the ones that are in, like I have pieces from each of these books in the original art show. I'm very excited about that. And of course, the, as Claire said, the silver medal for the great Zappino from the Society of Illustrators, and I'm very excited about that. Mac Barnett is a brilliant picture book writer, and this was the manuscript I received from him. And most of, as you said, Claire, like most of the text is pretty much in the beginning of the book, although, you know, that was sort of how I par partly front loaded it because there were so, there was so much activity toward like the middle and the end that needed to be told. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, some of that is pacing and we'll talk about that a little bit. Yes. Also, I called Mac when I got the manuscript and knew that this was gonna be my next project. And I asked him, you know, he had made some suggestions about what he wanted to have happen in the story. So like his notes were, you know, the top line notes were definitely something that carried the story, but there were specifics, like what is that Fino going to do? Like, what will his job be? Where is he gonna live? What's it gonna look like? Um, and some of those decisions, he said, I, you know, do what you think is best. And so that was kind of an, a wonderful um, way of collaborating because, you know, as I started to work, I didn't really know the answers to a lot of those questions. And so in the beginning, I thought of Zapfino as like the youngest in the Zapfino circus family. So that first drawing is like all the different, the parents and maybe siblings. And then the great Zapfino was this little scrawny, the last one. And in my mind, he just didn't want to be in the circus. It wasn't his thing. Um, I ended up kind of getting rid of the whole other family. Although in my mind, I still think of them that way. Um, and then the middle picture, I was sort of experimenting with what he might look like if he had a business sort of job, like wearing a pretty traditional suit. The picture on the, on the right, I took out of the newspaper because I love this statue of this person that was trying to just disappear into the wall. I felt like that was like the embodiment of this character. Like he really just did not want to be where he was in this story. Yeah. And um, I kind of used that as a way to kind of think about his state of mind. Yes. And then there were still more drawings of, you know, what's he going to look like? Does he have a lot of hair? Does he have no hair? What's, I don't know. And so basically after a lot of exploration, that drawing there is the one on the, on the, on the right that um, became what Zapfino looked like. Um, and then there were a lot of other decisions based on, like, as I said, the pagination, where do you turn the page? What is the story that I'm trying to tell, as well as the story that Mac told in words? What is his job going to be? What is the setting? Where should this book take place? I think I decided to do it in black and white because partly I, I knew that Fino wanted to disappear into this the world of this book like just sort of blend in in a way not be like focused on and I felt like doing it in black and white was sort of a way to do that I also did it as sort of a callback to early comic books because I felt like this had that that vibe as well 
And as I said, I do a lot of work trying to figure out the type. My oldest son, Graham, designed the type for In Every Life, which when you, I showed that cover and that was pretty great. But before he did that, I was working on this and I said, could you help me? He's a typeface designer and he has, he knows what he's doing. And he would give me some suggestions on how to do the type so that it made more sense or was more correct. <laughs> um, I had this postcard from Tel Aviv actually, and I loved this curved building. It was very mid-century and it reminded me of like beach towns that maybe are like Santa Monica in California or Miami or Tel Aviv. And I just sort of designed Zapfino's apartment based on this architecture. And then I also had this picture from the newspaper, which really cracked me up about these, these kids on Segway scooters with capes on and how I kind of wanted, I kind of decided when I saw this, like I want Zapfino to just stay in his circus outfit. I just, if he wants to, like, I don't want him to have to put on a suit or anything like that um, to blend into a job. I mean, he has his uniform for the um, elevator operator, but otherwise he's still in his, his cape and his, he still has a little circus in him. And so I set it at the beach for that reason, because really at the beach, you can wear anything you want and nobody cares. Um, but it was when I thought about him being an elevator operator that I feel like I, the story made sense to me. It was like, if he lives, it kind of came from, if he lives and works in the same place, then I don't have to draw him going back and forth to work. That saves a lot of pages in the book. Like that would be great. Cause like, that's not really that important part of, you know, to me, what, what he's grappling with. So it was like, okay, what could he do in the building in which he works? And then it was like an elevator operator, which kind of gave me the time period that the book was, was set in. And also the idea that he could spend all this time taking people safely up and down, up and down and himself and working through whatever issues he might have about, you know, heights. Yeah. <laughs> like all the stuff. And so it was like, oh, this is just great. And then it was like, I was not that thrilled about trying to figure out how to draw the mechanisms that make an elevator go up and down. So I was super excited when I realized, oh, I can just show the squares of the people in there. I don't have to worry about all that either. Anyway, so yeah. a lot of the decisions are sometimes based on, you know, what I want to draw. And one of the things I always love to draw are characters who have feelings, whatever those feelings are. And in the case of the great Zappino, one of the things Mac told me is he was always interested in characters that feel out of place in their own story. And I was like, ah, I know that feeling. <laughs> I think I felt like that a lot. Um, when I was a little kid, I didn't want to do a lot of the things I was supposed to do, like go to preschool. It was like, I don't want to do that. So I didn't. And then when it was time for kindergarten, it was like my parents said, no, no, you're going to school now. And it was very, I, there were often things that I was supposed to do that I wasn't ready to do. So in that case, I really identify with Zapfino. I did go to kindergarten. I did learn how to like it. Um, school, maybe not kindergarten, but I did learn how to like school. Um, but I also didn't want to spend the night at Lisa's house or go to camp, sleepaway camp, or a field trip was always somewhat stressful. I was just not really ready to do the things that it seemed like other my other friends around me were ready to do. And that was a feeling I had most of my life, still sometimes do actually. So a lot of my books are about characters that are sort of grappling with this feeling. And one of them is Walk On, which is called A Guide for Babies of All Ages. And it's about a baby who's kind of being told it's time to learn how to walk. It starts with, is sitting on your bottom getting boring, has lying around all the time, become entirely unacceptable. It's time to learn how to walk. And this baby's like, oh, really? <laughs> do, do I have to? Um, another book I did is 
called Roller Coaster, and it centers on the little girl in the front, and that's her older brother who's on the roller coaster with her. And in the book, we learn that this is the first time she's ever been on a roller coaster. Ooh, scary! I love that typeface for the um, for the title. Oh, thank you. That was de- that was designed by um, a letterer, him, a letterer, and then I took what he did and sort of painted it. Yes, yeah, so he's credited on there. But that was. Um, yeah, that was fun. So that little girl, is, you can see her in the front of the line, and she's never been on a roller coaster before, ever. And before it starts, you can see that she's like, eh, you know, like Zampino's thinking about it. Although in this case, once you're on the car, you pretty much are ready. You're going you're gonna to go. So basically, I thought it would be sort of fun to just talk about how to draw a character who's feeling particularly uncertain about something just as an as an exploration like when i was drawing this page i really wanted to show the subtlety of trying to make a decision like really grappling with like is this a good idea for me you know is this something that i want to do is it how do you show that and time passing and 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 not sort of be that you know I I wanted to be part of the story and I wanted to be funny and um there are sort of some tricks and I thought it would be fun to kind of just do some drawing and um talk about how to approach these questions fantastic Marla we're all so excited (laughs) and yeah the subtlety of those different body um you know expressions is it's all there and yeah it's wonderful so thank you for helping us learn this technique this morning so everybody I hope you have your materials ready and um, Ma's going to switch over to her I'm drawing thank over. you Let's so much for that. That. that fabulous presentation I learned so much myself it's really in- inspiring um so we have um, all kinds of visitors, uh, participants, I should say. <laughs> I'm used to having visitors at the museum, but uh, we have participants on our virtual program. They're coming in from Kentucky. Hi, Portia. Uh, we have Erin from Florida. We have Toma from Manhattan. We have three big fans from Long Island. Hi, Leah. Um, Alberta, Canada, that's Bev. Um, and then Nia's here, Rita from Maine. Uh, Lots of people are saying how wonderful, inspiring, and exciting it is to see these um, illustrations and hear the story of how you became an illustrator. Um, and there was a question so about, did you, <laughs> did you have any art training? I, I forgot to mention everybody. Of course, Marla absolutely has art training. She graduated from one of the best art schools in the world, um, Art Center College in Pasadena, which is an amazing, amazing school. and. For anybody who wants to become an illustrator or work in film, um, what else? There's a lot of graphic design, photography. It's a fantastic yeah, art. All kinds of, of art um, disciplines are taught there. Yeah. You know, I did go to Art Center after going through, you know, um, I went to, left high school, went to a community college for a year and a half, and then applied to Art Center and got in, and that was an incredible thing. Um, And I was so lucky to go to that school, but I didn't have a whole lot of um, art classes other than what was offered in school, like either electives in junior high and high school. And in the, you know, there were, there were art classes in my elementary public school and public school all the way through. And I, I I hope that you know there's still offerings of art classes in all the schools that um, you know kids are in because it's so important. But I think the most important thing is just having the the time and interest to sit down with pencil and paper and just draw. You know, yes. Yes. and practice. Find, practice. <laughs> yeah, it's so important <laughs> to have that space and time. Um, I feel like I learned a lot from, I would, you know, look at the cartoons or books or, and try and draw like the person whose work I was admiring. Yes. That is something that, you know, copying somebody whose work you love is an actual really great practice. 
to yeah, figure help. out yeah. what it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, with that, though, drawing from life, looking at something and drawing what you're seeing is also like a, a really great practice. It's sort of three things. And then also drawing from your imagination. All three of those things going on, you know, in, in your drawing life it are really important to do sort of concurrently all together. You know, it's good to draw from your own imagination. It's good to draw from something that you're looking at that trains your eye and hand in a different way. And it's, it's good to see what somebody else is doing. Look at what they're doing, kind of see if you can do it, if you like it. I think the trick is also just to make sure you're having a good time you know, that you're relaxed and you're having fun. Yes. And if you're relaxed and you're having fun, which is really the reason most of us end up drawing in the first place is because it kind of keeps us uh, amused and also calm and also just interested in life, engaged. And, and it should be, it should feel like that. Yes. If it doesn't, yeah. like, maybe you're trying to do something too hard and maybe you should think about yeah, no, that. That's absolutely correct. Draw what you love, at least yeah. start with that. And then you can get onto some things that might be more challenging, but yeah, yeah you'll develop. Well, this, 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 is a, love is this is a question for you, actually. We'll, we'll get into your drawing and then I'll, I'll ask a few very good questions that are coming in, Marla. <laughs> so. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to come over to this. Okay, I drew this because... I was thinking about like, okay, I, I'd like to draw characters that are a little nervous um, about something. Maybe we don't know what it is, but they seem a little anxious. And I thought, well, I'm kind of nervous about tomorrow. So <laughs> I decided to draw this picture of me in my studio thinking like, this is what it's going to feel like. Because one of the things um, about drawing in my studio is I'm usually all by myself. I'm not usually... Um, I'm going to turn this here. The sun's coming in. I hope that's all right. I'm not usually with all of you. So, okay. I want to start by just talking about character and like when you're designing a character, you know, how you decide what age your character is going to be. Like that's, that's sometimes an important part of your character. And I'm just going to show you a trick about that. So like, here are three heads. And I'm going to be real simple here. You can, you can draw along with me if you want to. Where you put the eyes is really important for how we understand how old the character is. So I'm going to put the eyes of this character up here. And I'm just being as simple as possible. And then I'm going to put the nose, here's the bottom of the nose, right around there. And then here's the mouth. And then I'm going to have the neck. Ears are usually from like the eye to the bottom of the nose. So we can just do that. And I think of this character here as looking somewhat maybe as a grown-up. Okay, so this one, I want it to look younger. I'm going to go a little bit halfway here and put the eyes here and the nose here and the mouth here. Here are the ears and a narrower neck. And I think this one looks more like kid. Okay, now here, we're going to go even lower in the not halfway, but even lower. Here are the eyes. Here's the nose. Here's the mouth. And there's no neck. This is just the body. And I feel like we have a baby. Yes. So, so really, it's like the eye line. You know, once you have sort of like the general age of your character, then you can add things like eyebrows, hair, clothes, like all the details, but just to get sort of like, what am I dealing with here? Is this an adult, a child, a baby? Um, that is important. And this actually is, it works even where you're, when, when you're not drawing people. For instance, 
Let me show you something. Okay, so let's do it again. Um, and we're going to do this. This is going to be a different kind of an animal. I mean, it's not a human. Can you tell what it is yet? Okay, so this is going to be a younger dog. This is a dog. So I'll just let you know a few comments now whilst we're getting to okay. see these wonderful little family of dogs <laughs> creating, <laughs> being created before our very eyes. And actually, Teresa is joining and says, what a great way to explain age in your drawings. I love this tip. Um, loves your work and can really feel the fun that goes into the drawings. And oh, um, she is wondering what um, what it was like working on It Takes a Village by um, Hillary Clinton. Did you have any meetings at the White House? I did get to meet Hillary. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't call her just Hillary, but I did get to meet her and like Madam Secretary. Um, she she was um she was amazing. And I remember after the book was was finished, mm -hmm. we were standing at a she was speaking at an ALA event, American Library Association event, and I got to meet her again. And she and this was after the election, and we all know what happened with that election. And um, Hillary took the book and hugged it to herself and said, this is the world I wish we were in. And it just felt like such a compliment to, you know, the, the, the illustrations in the book. It was really... It does take a village. Uh, we all you know, appreciate that you, you know, small villages and as a world. Um, Portia is saying, is there a story or book that you've always wished you could have illustrated or could in the future illustrate? Yeah. So oh, something. Gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, and I'm trying to think, I mean, there are certain, I don't know if I could kind of name them right now, but there are certain like um, poems or folk tales or fairy tales that I have in sort of my mind that would be kind of fun maybe at some point to tackle. Mm -hmm. um, I have some ideas that, you know, I haven't really reached the point where, you know, I'm ready to, to work on them yet, but I hope to. Yes. Um, there's more books in your future, Marla, we know. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so like those are like the, the ideas of kind of thinking about the ages of characters. And then I just want to talk about, you know, drawing the 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 character itself for a second and then work with the, this particular character. I I did a, a drawing when I was growing up that looked pretty much like this. This is like my childhood drawing of a person. And um, I remember actually a lot of my drawings doing this drawing like it was pretty much like this yeah. um so that let's say is a person and so i i'm going to do a similar drawing but it won't be you know exactly that but let's say based on that because i think it's i think zapfino in a way was based on that mm -hmm. i really did um you know, the stripes and just sort of the simplicity of that phenomenon. Yeah, the beautiful simplicity of it. The, the, the same with the farm and the clown. There's just such a beautiful simplicity and charm. Yeah, exactly. and, and, you know, I often start, and with animation, people do this too in animation, like with really simple shapes. And I feel like yeah. if I can get the shapes, mm -hmm. um, the thing about picture books is that you have to draw that character again and again. Sometimes the character grows up and like time passes. And so you, you want the character to still look like themselves, but older, which is why that doing those experiments with the eyes, like once you get the character, then you can just sort of work with like aging the character a little bit and yeah. still the same, the same character. So let's say, um, you know, if you have simple shapes, and you're drawing that character walking away from the from you or sitting down or upside down or any of the positions that they might be in in the book it's like those shapes kind of ground you and you can you can always rely on them to 
how the viewer recognize that that's the same person. Okay, so this is going to be our character that we're going to work with in this exercise. So similar to, um, to that one, but, you know, slightly different. Well, you already see the expression, right? Everybody see how the hands are and the eyes are looking down. <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> Might have just seen something a little scary. <laughs> yeah, he's like, whoa, that's me. Oh, that's what's me. that? <laughs> okay, so here we have our, our character based on my, my, and I also am showing, I'm kind of using a lot of different kinds of paper, and I want to talk about that. I have mm -hmm. Xerox paper, I have manila paper, I have, um, you know, just like lined paper. A lot of my childhood drawings are based are drawn on like stationery or things that came in the mail because that's mm -hmm. just what we had around and that's great. Yeah, and use the paper wherever you are, kids. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you just um, want to have enough paper that when you make mistakes, you can grab another one and it's not a big deal. Yes, yes, just keep drawing. Right. Um, here's yeah. a wonderful question from Katie. Um, can you speak about your artistic inspirations and also about how you figured out your particular style? That's a really good question. I mean, we heard about some of Marla's inspirations when she gave her presentation. It was blueberries for Sal and, of course, the amazing Marie Sendak, where the wild things are. But I guess your style evolves from just doing a lot of drawing. But can you speak a little bit more to that, Marla? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, my childhood inspirations were definitely Maurice Sendak and um, Crockett Johnson, who did Harold and the Purple Crayon and um, The Carrot Seed, those books. Like, he was a cartoonist as well. Yeah. Um, the simplicity of his work really spoke to me. Um, McCloskey, who did, Robert McCloskey, who did Blueberries for Sal, he didn't have a simple style, but he, he no. had such strong draftsmanship that, like, meaning he could draw anything I mean yeah. you know and and we were talking about Trina Shart Hyman who also has that incredibly strong yes and she is an amazing illustrator everyone so maybe um Lindsay if you could put her name in the chat just in case um folks want to check that illustrator out Trina Shart Hyman um so also there's a question here um how did you come up with all those characters in the elevators? <laughs> That's a good question. Oh, that was fun. Um, you know, I think that feeling, I'm, I'm drawing some emotions here that aren't necessarily being afraid to do something, but you can kind of, you can, that's a, a grouchy person. Um, <laughs> and I just want to show you some of like the, the ways that you can change with like the simplest things, like, sort of the, the the look of a character. Um, this I feel like might look sort of blissful. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, the question was about the elevator. <laughs> so, I know. Well, you have so many character scenarios going on in the, the elevators. Uh, and we're, we're, I guess you just- well, I know what I was sorry. going to say. I know what I was going to say. <laughs> You know, when you're in an elevator and you're just like, it's so odd to be in an elevator with, with people sometimes, like you're just, you're so close and you yes. can hear conversations sometimes or everybody's quiet and it's like, hi, you know, it's just. Yeah, yeah you're trying to be polite, but maybe they've got interesting packages or yeah. a dog with you and you, are people going to pet the dog? <laughs> it's like, True. So there was a sense of like my trying to remember some of those instances, like what was going on. I remember being in an elevator with people that were really angry with each other. You could tell and like they were talking and then I got in and then they stopped and, you know, there's that tension. Um, yeah. So I was just, and then I, I remember thinking, you know, of just like that. There's one elevator scene where there's like a big, big teddy bear from a fair. Yes, yes, the big bear. And now, like everybody in the elevator, like, whoa, you're actually getting into <laughs> yeah. that. Um, so I was thinking of instances that might be. Might yes. Be um, and like I, I, one of them, I, I. I thought it would, I, I was watching a pizza delivery person bring pizza to my neighbor across the street. And I was thinking, oh, that would be funny to have like a pizza, pizza guy in the elevator. And you probably, people are hungry and they're like, oh, I wish I could have that pizza. 
Yes, yes, feet. Um, Definitely something that turns up in elevators and apartment blocks for sure. <laughs> and people have birthday parties. I think one of them had a, a balloon delivery or something, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, a bunch of balloons in the elevator. Yes. And then yes. like, I think there was a stray cat or dog and somebody with yes, a Yes, it was definitely a dog. I spotted that. So oh, that was really fun. Those were that really could be fun. a really good exercise, everybody. Just draw yourself like an elevator rectangle and, or, you know, upright rectangle box and then start drawing characters all kinds of characters inside that that's a very fun idea to practice drawing different characters and look how Marla's expressions are just coming alive on the page oh that's so know, I just I'm just trying to draw different expressions and I think this one is just like a neutral expression like John Clausen is so wonderful at neutral yes expressions. yes um where maybe you don't have a feeling but maybe make a bunch of circles and just try and do as many as you can yes I, I'm like, I feel like if you don't think about it maybe you're doing it while you're listening to music or watching a movie or you know like you're just yeah. hanging out at the table with your family and just just draw and and not think about it too much um so these are a bunch of different expressions but I want to talk about like maybe an expression like specifically about being nervous about something or afraid to do something or just apprehensive about doing something um because that has its own i think things that i do to get that emotion across like and 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 a few of those things are like for instance wide eyes and and so people like widen their eyes sometimes if they're if they're afraid of something so yeah me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and also a low mouth mm -hmm. kind of gets a sense of um that gulp you know like mm -hmm. and yeah, so low mouth. I feel mm -hmm. like that that kind of gives a sense of maybe being nervous I I think one of the things I like to think about when I'm drawing characters is that they have an internal life like they're thinking about something we might not know what it is but we want to see that mm -hmm. that's something that's going on in their mind yes and and so this is just like maybe with their face and we'll talk about like body language too but um yeah I, I, that's a really good tip. But yeah, you've got to think about what your character might be really thinking. So it's a two-dimensional drawing, but you're bringing it to life with just yeah. lines. Um, gosh, you know, Marla, we could have a whole hour longer with you because you're so amazing. I think um, Lindsay behind the scenes might let us go a few minutes over just because I'd love you to draw a body. But we're oh, getting okay. close to the end. Oh, we're getting close to the end. I can't believe it. Anyway. Okay. Um, so how, how much... <laughs> Do we have time for me to draw a body? Yes, I think we'll have oh, okay. time for you to draw a big body. I think everyone okay, so here's here's a couple more. And then here's here's something that I was wondering too. It's like sometimes, you know, just putting hands over the eyes and stuff, which also, you know, kind of says a lot, you know, yeah. Your body into, into it. And one of the things I wanted to um kind of talk about when we start talking about like drawing a body or even just expressions is to 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 model it for yourself like mm. um sometimes when I'm trying to draw a character doing something I I can't draw it and then I end up having to stand up and and do it like if I wanted to draw somebody who's feeling kind of confident or you know like mm -hmm. you know I'll get up and I'll do it and and yeah. just feeling it in your body is enough sometimes to, to yeah it. translate it so you enact yeah. it yourself so you can get the feeling right yeah. away yes it's actually that's the first time I've actually thought about that and you, I think you're the first um illustrator to think about using yourself as the model because a lot of illustrators do take photographs or use reference they have family members come in and pose for them but yeah if you don't have somebody available to do that where you can say could you stand looking a little hunched over and sad you do it yourself just to get that feeling like oh you know yeah use yourself as a model <laughs> that's a good idea right. right you know like um animators often have a mirror at their oh. drawing table right to kind it's of see their expression and stuff but I mean you can do it 
certainly a mirror works when you're trying to do a facial expression, but it doesn't necessarily work when you're trying to do um, your whole body. Right. Sure. But you but can feel it. I, th I love the way you said it. To it right. So you can feel it. Yes. You can feel it. And like sometimes it's as much as um, kind of just trying to figure out like, where's my weight? What, what leg am I standing on? Have I done something cocky with my elbow? Like, am I like protecting myself and hunching my my shoulders you know like there's yep. a certain kind of openness you can have or a kind of you know and those those sorts of things you can actually feel and I think are are really really helpful I get up a lot yes. yeah these are great Erin uh, just uh, said love these character design hacks thank you Marla um, oh, thank yeah you. and love your studio Leo saying yeah but we love your studio um Lindsay and I were admiring it as well. <laughs> so yeah, it's a wonderful studio. Uh, you know, some artists do um, have fabulous studios, which you get to see here on Virtual Saturday Stories. So that's some behind the scenes that we bring to you. So thank you for joining us. I'm not going to quite close out just yet, but I will just say a couple of things while Marla's doing this um, full body pose here. Do send in any drawings that you do. Don't be afraid. We, we'd love to see them and I share them with Marla. It's great for us to just show our sponsors what our participants um, get from this kind of programming, how enriching and inspiring it is. Uh, so don't, don't worry, we're not going to sort of publish them unless you <laughs> gave us permission to. So, but we'd love to see. So just share your drawings. And if you want to continue drawing, after this, just send in what you do later. You don't have to send it in right now. You can send it to my email anytime. I'll share it with Marla. You can also, of course, follow Marla on Instagram. Go look over at her website. Do see her art pieces at our art show if you're in Manhattan and all the other wonderful illustrations that we have on display. There are gonna be over 200, probably close to 250 pieces on the two floors. And our four medalists will be featured in our main gallery. And we'll be doing a little work sheet that you can pick up at the front desk and you can go around and draw and um, find things to look at. All the different books that are, are featured have different genres. Um, you have different materials being used, different styles. And um, as you can see, so the question earlier about how did you, you know, develop your style? Um, this is something that I think you can tell from the amount of books that Marla has done. It's really from drawing. And also, I think what she's also said is that if you like a certain style of illustration, there's books that you love, you can sort of copy those for a little while, just try drawing in that style, and then you'll start developing your own style. Um, it's not yeah, I, have, I have something really important to say about that, because I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of people I've taught for a long time now, and a lot of people feel like as they're trying to develop their style that they're supposed to draw or paint in a certain way right and and there's a struggle there it's like right. what we were talking about about being kind of not as relaxed and happy as you should be when you're working and i feel like if you could often i'll have my very grown-up students go back to when they were kids and they were drawing and they were happy and try and uh, access that place again. Yes. And so, so, and they do, and then they come out, their style emerges from that place. So yes. actually like the style is already in you. It's uh, already there. There you go, it's already in you. Just find it with joy, find it with, right. yeah. And then, you know, when you learn how to do things more like fundamentally, like you have drawing classes and you know perspective and you know it's practice and all of that is like practicing a musical instrument. Like, but when you're finding your style, your yeah. own personal unique style, you go back. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So true. Yeah, that's actually a very good comparison. Yeah, you get good at playing an instrument by practicing. <laughs> so really your art materials are your instrument. And that's another thing find an art material that you really gravitate towards and then try something different. Um, Marla's worked in all kinds of materials. If you look at all her picture books, she works in color and uh, she works in pencil, uh, oh, I paint. I love pencil. I just love it. I don't think I'll ever, ever give it up. I just, you know, <laughs> some people love to paint and I just love to draw. So yeah. there's, a, 
here's an example. I just drew this character who's like sort of maybe afraid to walk into that door. Yes. And like, we don't know why, but he is she, he, I don't know. But um, also you can use composition to accentuate the emotion. So I, I added the door, the character's small in relation to the door. Yeah. Because sometimes we feel also like if we're nervous about something, maybe not as big and strong as we want to. So you can use those emotions to kind of make the composition reflect that. So that's beautiful. Yeah. There's yeah. so much in this one little drawing that Marla's just done. There's a story about to evolve. What is going to happen? What's behind the door? You know, there's a story already happening. And that's what's exciting, everybody. Just draw something and see what comes to mind as another picture that could follow that or could be something else could be added there maybe there's a little leg peering out <laughs> I don't know. anyway thank you so much everybody for joining us this morning it's been such an incredible pleasure to have Marla and you have been so inspiring to everybody I've just read a whole bunch of compliments in the chat everyone's been so happy to see you this morning and learn so much and thank you so much for sharing thank your you. behind the scenes and uh, we hope one day to have you at the Society of Illustrators in person. Wow, that would be so fantastic. Um, in the future, come and do a workshop in person. I know you want to get to New York at some point, but when you oh, do, have you come and do a workshop. <laughs> so, it's, thank it's you. been such a pleasure. Thank you guys for being here and thank you. For yes, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and week ahead. And Omala, really, thank you so much. And your work is incredible. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.